Good afternoon. The topic of my presentation is non-referential architecture, the social task of the architect. I begin with the thesis of my presentation. First, the foremost social task of the architect does not lie in the economic, ecological, or the political, it lies in the designing of buildings that make people creative and extend people's possibilities. Therefore, the architect's social task is in the realm of the artistic philosophical and not in the organizational. Second, buildings can no longer be derived from a common social ideal because no such common social ideal have endured. We live in an increasingly non-ideological world. Third, today's architect is not of lesser importance as we hear too often. The opposite is true. The architect is a mastermind of a team with the propensity to be a creative thinker. The architect's foremost social responsibility lies in the spiritual, speculative, and synthetic creative domain. Here, I offer a first interjection. Hashim Sarkis, the current artistic director of the Architecture Biennale of Venice, stated the following in an interview published in Arc Daily on October 14th, he says, I do not think we have ever witnessed a moment where we have relied as much on architecture in order to capture our individual identities and project them out for others to see. Architects do change the world. They do so mostly by creating alternative worlds, wish images as Sarkis calls them, for what the world could be, end quote. I'm not entirely sure what Sarkis means with wish images, but I think he too understands that the architect's societal contribution is not one as an organizer, a community organizer even, but as a speculative author who creates architectonic spaces in which people can think and imagine freely. As for the pamphlet, Non-Referential Architecture, from which most of what I am going to present is taken, I want to preempt any misconception. The position taken in the book is neither utopian nor dystopian nor has it anything in common with the Frankfurt School's legacy of critical theory or worse with its brainchild wokeism that disguises itself as liberalism yet despises empiricism and open argument. The book very straightforwardly deals with the world as we find it today, nothing less and nothing more. To emphasize this position, I read a short section from the preface of the book. One other important delineation ought to be made. It is a limitation. This book on non-referential architecture is not an attempt to solve what might be perceived as larger societal problems. Despite the fact that it does consider the fundamental currents of the contemporary non-referential world in very broad terms, the book does not do this. It does consider the world broadly, but only with a view to demonstrating why non-referential architecture is the only possible way to make architecture today. However, the book does not alter or idealize any larger societal currents in any one direction. As a matter of fact, it very deliberately does not attempt to do so, as it embraces the world as it is and goes from there. We do not see ourselves as wealth verbesserer, 
starry-eyed starry idealists or do-gooders, nor do we think that this is the chief task of architects. This book aims to be as non-ideological as possible and strives to discuss architecture in our non-referential world as it currently happens to be for good or bad. That an excerpt from the book, from the preface. To dispel another misconception closely or more closely related to the discipline of architecture. Nowhere in the book does it state that architects cannot use references. It is a given that architects will always be influenced by one thing or another and therefore will make references. I have begun this lecture with its thesis and a little bit of positioning. Now, before I go on, let me say a few other things. First, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to attend my presentation. Second, more specifically, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Marcelo Stamm for inviting me to give this keynote address for the practice-based doctoral seminar. I know there are other colleagues involved in this effort. So let me also thank Dorotea Ottaviani, Aaron Betsky, Richard Blythe, Susan Piedmont Palladino, as well as their maybe less visible helpers in the background. And the third and final thing I want to say before I return to the lecture, and it has to do with the scope of today's presentation. When Marcelo graciously invited me to present the book Non-Referential Architecture, I proposed to him not to give a synopsis of the book. I argue that it makes not too much sense for me to do that, given that the book is a very short one, specifically written for busy practicing architects with little time. The entire book can be easily read in one evening or maybe two evenings if one is a slow reader, as most of us architects tend to be. I also have to say, I would probably not be the person who wants to abbreviate the book. We, this means also acclaimed architect Valerio Olgiati, with whom I have collaborated to conceive this book. We tried to write the book in a manner like a car designer would conceive a Formula One racing car. To make its argument, the book has exactly the correct number of sentences and words in that specific constellation as you find them on its pages. Not unlike a Formula One racing car has wings and fins located in exactly the correct place to drive as fast as possible. I would argue that the book is precise and deliberate. So if I now would change and subtract parts from the whole, I would make the book less effective. There is no substitute to read the entire book and try to understand it. So I could say today that my task today is to provoke you or your commonly held convictions sufficiently so that it rouses your sensibilities and you begin to engage with the content of the book. When the book appeared in 2018, I received a good number of notes from strangers. One of my favorite is still the one I received from Anka, uh, an architect from uh, Berlin who also teaches there at uh, their university. Her initial note was very short and somewhat contradictory and seemingly masochistic. She wrote, I translate, I have read the book of books until it hurt, meant positively. Thank you, end quote. She later wrote that it was painful for her to be confronted with such an obvious, with such obvious realities about architecture 
and have challenged so many of her preconceptions. She later also told me that she read the entire book aloud to her students. She stood in front of the class and read it. She also required every person in her own architecture office to read the book and apparently there it caused heated arguments and a sort of a fight in her office. Of course, I highly encourage all of you, professors and practicing architects, to do the same. So let's turn the page here and talk about some of this. The basic question of my talk is, what is the social task of the architect? The corollary question is, what is the social task of the architect today? To give an answer to these questions, and this is also the structure of my presentation today, we need to attempt to understand and to bridge, A, how the major social currents of today's world are different from the one of postmodernity, but very important, and this is B, we also need to assert the nature of architecture. In other words, how do buildings fundamentally speak to us in order to demonstrate as to how architecture gains social relevance? I finish, or I will finish, with some concluding remarks. Let me begin with thoughts on the architect's social terrain of the early 21st century. The basic question to keep in mind for us architects, how does an architect conceive buildings that have social value if buildings can no longer be derived from common social ideal because no such common social ideals have endured in today's world. It has been demonstrated that there is a sort of a cesura, a more or less clear cut that fundamentally distinguishes a postmodernity, a period that we could bookend, at least in architecture, with the years 1960 to 2000, from B our current world we live in today. For the purpose of this presentation, I point to four thinkers who have identified that aforementioned cesura. First, the philosopher and cultural theorist Peter Sloterdijk was chastised as reactionary when in recourse to the two philosophers Nietzsche and Heidegger in his untranslated lecture Regeln für den Menschenpark of 1999, he demanded a fundamentally new codex for mankind, given the increasing possibilities of what human beings can accomplish. With his lecture, Sloterdijk announced the end of humanism. Second, the political scientist and economist Francis Fukuyama raised a major storm when in his 1989 essay, The End of History, he argued that the advent of Western liberal democracy may signal the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and be the final form of government. Fukuyama's thesis implies the end of ideologies. Third, Michel Welbeck's scandalous 1998 novel Atomized, also known as The Elementary Particles, addresses the increasing and ever more radical individuation of the human condition in our world. Since this is largely an American audience, I want to make sure that you do not mistake these observations as one contained to hedonistic French, gloomy Northern Europeans, 
and Harakiri practicing Japanese. Fukuyama is actually an American born in Chicago. And so I am also invoking a source with impeccable East Coast liberal credentials. The political scientist Robert Putnam's masterpiece, Bowling Alone, based on his 1995 essay with the same title, which served as another foghorn of a quickly approaching atomized society, was considered too pessimistic by the critics at the time. Today, we know that Putnam understated the case. These four towering examples have to suffice here to describe the world we are operating now, operating in now. It's the world after postmodernity. We could say we have a fundamental dissolving of everything. Now, one thing has to be said, the dissolving of everything is actually embedded in modernity. It is its DNA. It is just so that the world has never fully reckoned with this attribute, despite the fact that, for example, Frederick Nietzsche pointed to this attribute already 150 years ago. The substitution of the church's dogma with state's ideologies was only a temporary and somewhat naive delay of this inevitable dissolution of everything. Today, the state has lost its coalescing power too. In architecture, Robert Venturi, Peter Eisenman, Bernhard Schumi, Rain Kohlhaas and Jacques Herzog are the key figures who have prepared in various ways the ground on which we stand on. However, Kohlhaas seems to speak for his entire generation when he agreed, albeit reluctantly, that we are leaving the ideologies of modern and postmodern architecture behind and are entering something new. He stated the following in a lecture given at Harvard University a few years ago. People over 50 have a tendency to worry and people under 50 have a tendency not to care. What is detected here is not so much that people today do not care, but they are not seduced by 20th century notions such as project and program. Today, people want to confront the complexities of life in a non-ideological way. Here, I want to point back to Sloterdijk's brilliant analysis one more time, because what he discusses is also relevant for the social task of the architect. Sloterdijk states that humanism can only go as far as taming the human condition, but, and here he invokes Nietzsche, is ill-equipped for an ever-increasing liberation expressed in the potentation of the active subjective side of a human being. It is exactly that passive active zesura in the degree of liberation of the individual human being that is relevant for the architect's social task today. In analogy to Plato's image of the shepherd and the herd, the world of today is increasingly a world without ideologies, without gods, without institutional authorities, and thus without humanism. The controversies that Sloterdijk, Fukuyama, Welbeck, and Putnam caused are the world as it is now. What they have discovered was inevitable. 
In contrast, the old multicultural world of postmodernity proposed the coexistence of affirmed sets of values. Its biggest challenge was to establish common and coherent notion of value in a society characterized by the diversity of people from around the world. The key concept behind such attempts is integration. This concept is subject to a postmodernist ideology going back to the 1960s, namely one that assumes societal aims to be relatively homogenous, one that presumes very similar needs and interests. Again, today, this is no longer the case because today Plato's shepherd does not exist anymore. Today, not only are there very few people who could even know what these needs, interests and values would be, these values certainly do not carry with them the strength of a widespread consensus so as to give structure and order to our world. In today's world, societal aims are differentiated into a plethora of individuals and groups with completely different interests that make coalescence all but impossible. The image of the sociological population structure shows that common identifiable needs of people on a sufficiently large scale of no or numbers do not exist. Because as Sloterdijk also has demonstrated, even the notion of a more or less coherent people no longer exists. In today's world, we do not share a project or a program any longer. As we did fervently in the epoch of modernity, in architecture exemplified quite well with the programs advocated by Le Corbusier, Gideon, Johnson and Hitchcock, just to mention the most well-known. And critically, in postmodernity, essentially the discourse associated with the seminal year of 1968. We could say that we are living in an increasingly non-ideological world. This situation should perhaps be lamented, but it does not help to do so. You can lament the dissolution of ideologies, but it is more productive to understand this process as something liberating, as a sense of freedom and of a sense of new possibilities. It is an opportunity to make a liberated architecture befitting today's world. Here I want to interject again something I have already mentioned once earlier. The book Non-Referential Architecture, its thesis respectively, is not, is not a negation, not yet another dystopian prophecy. In the context of this short lecture, I can only assert that here once more, However, I highly recommend to you to listen to philosopher Vera Bühlmann's lecture, I translate in English, in the non-referential, the unbound text and the metaphysical gesture. A lecture she gave in Austria this past summer and one that is viewable on YouTube. I don't know Vera Bühlmann personally, I've never met her or spoken to her, but she is much better equipped than I will ever be to analyze the book and lay open its nuanced philosophical extensions. I am therefore quite thankful to her that she took on our book on that sophisticated level as she did, as part of her architecture lecture cycle, Pop to Canon. In any case, our non-referential world presents radical new challenges for the architect as well. The postmodernist architectural discourse confronted the socio-political complexities of urban life, but its proposals were aided 
by the accepted viability of the referential modern project. The task of today's architecture is a different one. Its buildings have to be significant in a world that does not embrace significance. It is a fundamental shift from an architecture that offers its inhabitants a way of participating in a life affirming known totality they believe in and move toward an architecture that offers inhabitants a way to build a life assuring totality that they believe does, not, does ultimately not exist. It must be asserted. It is the idea for one single building by the architect that is the only thing that gives meaning to that building. Like the herd with an absent shepherd, it is now the architect's task to design buildings that mean something. Not a fixed meaning a program, but to design buildings that trigger a sense about something existential about a person's life. This situation describes a new and undeniably difficult state in which we find ourselves today, but any attempt to resuscitate old societal models is futile. By now, it's, it should be clear that sense-making, one of the key concepts of the book, is not understood as meaning that a building is a receptacle of some external significance applied to the building. But rather, the building itself helps its occupant to construct sense. It is best understood, it is best to understand the building as an object that makes people creative. In the following 265 words in one section, I am making claims that are described throughout the main parts of the book and its seven chapters. Experience of space, oneness, newness, construction, contradiction, order, and sense-making. Naturally, this raises the question as to how a sense-making architectural idea of social presence is brought to realization. Architecture is a very basic physical undertaking and exists as a formal construct. And indeed, a kind of a basic precondition exists that cannot be avoided in buildings, the physical experience of space. Such experience of space is an undisputed, as it were, raw material with which any building must deal. It is the key to architecture. It is the key to beauty, to sense-making, and also to social value. In this respect, by means of their presence, rooms give buildings subjective universality. Understood in these terms, the form of rooms, both inside and outside, ultimately remains the most general architectonic of a building. It is architectural form that brings to people an added cultural value and it is form that sets individuals and society in motion. This always has been the potential of architecture. Everything else, economy, ecology, politics, and all the other extra architectural content, while undoubtedly present and of influence, is ultimately for the building not decisive. These aspects are not decisive because they are not generally valid for a building. It is a mistake to make buildings dependent on such non-general values. Precisely because it is unable to rely on any larger consensus, 
Today's architecture can only be of general validity if it expresses something that is real and actual, as generally valid as possible, and as close as possible to be true. Therefore, above all else, architecture is a question of form, namely the conceiving of rooms on the outside and inside. It is in the chapter on newness that describes the question as to what it is that allows an architect to fulfill his or her social task. Consider this, only a building that is new, a building that embodies a quality of something that has never been present before for a person in the way that they encounter it, has the power to rouse their power of imagination and to captivate them. It must be unequivocally stated that architecture must strive for newness in order to fulfill its social task. Now, how is newness defined? Newness is understood as an aspect of novelty, of a basic experiential cognition in a formal architectonic sense. In contrast, even if a building is well conceived and built with great constructive skill and perhaps also with great technological innovation, but does not have newness, it is only a work of craft and is not enough to fulfill architects' ultimate social task, namely to engage people in a dialogue and discourse and to make people creative. In contrast to this unequivocal recognition of newness for architecture, many new buildings are justified and defended as worthy by architectural critics because they correspond with certain ideologies or so-called schools of thought. This is an untenable situation in a world in which no significance can be gained through subscribing to ideologies. Rather than ascribing great value to buildings precisely because they fulfill prescribed and predetermined expectations, it is an aspect of newness that it touches people in a certain creative way that is fundamental and precedes any critical legitimation. It is precisely this social task and role of architecture that is the ultimate reason why buildings must have aspects of something new. Therefore, newness has a specific social task in architecture. Newness is the initiator that provokes the viewer of a building to engage in a discourse with the building and therefore with the world. Without newness, viewers will simply leave a building by the wayside as they do with all buildings that do not contain something that engages them. It is again the architect who assumes the responsibility for designing something that contains newness. This is no simple task. Newness requires a kind of a philosophical moment in as much as architects expose themselves to a thesis that must contain aspects of newness. The architect must understand the prevalent societal currents of the world in which they work so that they can assess the degree of newness that engages people creatively. In a more extensive discussion of newness and the social responsibility of the architect, 
The book compares the work of Frank Gehry and Antonio Gaudi. And argues as to why Frank Gehry's work had a much more fundamental and meaningful social relevance than the work of Gaudi did when it was built. The example, or for example, the fact that Frank Gehry was able to judge his times correctly and that his work was not rejected as being bizarre and absurd speaks directly to his capability to understand nascent societal currents, not unlike a sniffer dog who senses how far it must go to get to newness. The book argues to be able to do so, non-referential architecture argues to be able to do so, is arguably the most difficult social competence required of an architect. Therefore, the most important topic here in relation to newness is the architect's capability to access society's sensibilities so that they can conceive a building that has just the right amount of newness. Architecture should never be bizarre, nor can it be desirable for people to begin to associate buildings with the bizarre. It is an important and difficult question for architects to establish where exactly these demarcations happen to lie at any given time. These boundaries are constantly shifting and require a fine-tuned awareness of the current world on the part of the architect. The architect must know the world very well, otherwise they cannot creatively define newness. Needless to say, our non-referential world in which architects are given very little guidance on what to do, makes the demand for newness even more challenging. But that is the task at hand. The architect has no other choice than to somehow become very attuned to the currents of the world. The architect must indeed become not unlike a, a sleuth, a sort of a sniffer dog, who can design buildings with aspect of newness of such a degree that they become actualized just prior to the moment when these architectonic formulations become acceptable to a sufficiently large segment of society. Once these formulations have become fully accepted and known to most of society, they have already relinquished their epistemological power to rouse people creatively. This process is accelerated today because digital communication seemingly enables everybody to see everything instantly. This sensitive and highly calibrated capability to know your own world is the foremost reason why architects or why society needs architects and how society benefits most from having architects. Accordingly, we can uh, state that the ability to define newness architectonically is the foremost social task of the architect. In conclusion, the need for architects who have the capacity to fulfill the social task as outlined above has only become supremely paramount in recent times. Because to use this metaphor one more time, until recently the world believed in shepherds. 
until the end of the era of postmodernism, about 20 years ago, the social task of the architect was largely contained within the discipline of architecture in the sense that it helped to move architecture within the ideational boundaries of a given epoch. Until the end of postmodernity, the architect was firmly embedded in the more or less fixed societal, philosophical, and professional aspiration of any given society and its culture. The architect's task was to build for those common societal values. This should not be understood as meaning that in the past, even the best architects were mere building facilitators. It means that even the most admired and most provocative architects had the benefit of operating in the relative stability of more or less fixed sets of societal values. It was a source of comfort that architects could deduce larger societal currents for their own work. In lapidary terms, it may be stated that architects knew what they had to do. The formidable task of the architect was to design beautiful and sense-making buildings as exemplifications of one or the other world conception. What is different today is that the architect has no ideational apparatus that predefines what ought to be embodied in buildings. Yes, architects have always been form givers to society to some extent. However, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to be a form giver of a society that does not know its own form. Therefore, today, the task of the architect is to modify expectations and to frame our lives. It is because of that societal shift towards the atomized, to, to use Welbeck's thesis, that architects must be authors for the most basic human existential quests. Accordingly, just as their work is always public and never private. The architect is always a public figure. The architect is not characterized by any kind of asocial reclusiveness. Instead, architects are responsible towards society because they are dedicated to the discovery of that society's limits. The architect seeks to comprehend how the world ticks. To be able to reflect on problems of this nature and scale, the architect has a keen understanding of the world. The architect has a flair for and access to the societal currents that move the world at a given time. The architect offers buildings that add something new. In the common terminology of today, we could call it a cultural added value that make people think and thus bring movement to a society. That is the task. Everything else, functionality, construction, economic and ecological concerns is self-evident and the daily bread of designing and constructing buildings. These concerns are ultimately handiwork, craft, skills, organization, and the application of technological possibilities. However, a building is only culturally and socially valuable if there is also a speculative dimension. This is created through artistic and scientific innovation. Architects have a primordial task that they cannot give away. Architects cannot give away that task because there is simply nobody else who could meet this challenge. 
Thank you.